He resolutely refused to use artificial fertilizers and weed killers. Chemical was a dirty word uh, in our household, and the word natural had uh, an almost sacred resonance in the household of my childhood. And I've never fully thrown off that early influence, and I can think my way back into it in an instant. But I left the land and became a Darwinian scientist and so came to look upon nature in a different way not necessarily incompatible but at least different and that's what I'm going to talk about popular views of nature often regard it as a more or less benign benign towards the species that comprise it even benign towards the continuation of life itself or the ecosystem itself and this ethos, which used to pervade natural history television programs, goes something like this. Nature is self-sustaining, self-preserving. There is a balance of nature, a balance of species within the ecosystem, such that all work for the preservation of the whole. Until man comes along with his exploitative, selfish, unnatural greed and ruins it. Ten minutes is not long enough to make many points, so I'll, I'll just make one. My point will be that this disagreeable quality of our own species is not new, not unique, not peculiar to us, and is very, very natural. It's a universal quality of all life, which doesn't make it good. On the contrary, it's something to be fought against. Far from being the most selfish, exploitative species, Homo sapiens is the only species that has at least the possibility of rebelling against the otherwise universally selfish Darwinian impulse. The humans are no worse than the rest of the animal kingdom. We're no more selfish than other animals. We're just more effective in our selfishness and therefore more devastating. All animals do what natural selection program their ancestors to do, which is look after the short-term interests of themselves, their close family, their cronies, their allies. If any species in the history of life has the possibility of breaking away from short-term selfishness and of long-term planning for the distant future, it's our species. We are Earth's last best hope, even if we are simultaneously the species most capable of destroying life on the planet. But when it comes to taking the long view, we are literally unique, because the long view is not a view that has ever been taken before in the whole history of life. If we don't plan for the future, no other species will. there's a tension between short-term individual welfare and long-term group welfare or world welfare. If it were left to the forces of Darwinism alone, in one sense there could be no hope because short-term greed is bound to win. There is a hope that lies in the unique human capacity to use our big brains with our massive communal database, all the libraries, all the computers, all the knowledge that we've built up over the generations, and our forward simulating imaginations. This is what things like the Kyoto Accords and similar initiatives are all about. But to a Darwinist, it's not surprising that it's so hard to get agreement in support of such political initiatives. Darwinism is unfortunately not friendly to the values of sustainability, the long-term values of life as a whole. To the extent that our values stem from Darwinian selection of our ancestors, this would seem to be a pessimistic conclusion. The only solution to problems of sustainability, and things like that, 
is long-term foresight. And long-term foresight, as I've said, is something that Darwinism in itself doesn't have. Well, I've said that hope lies in a, our unique human capacity for foresight, but how, you might ask, do we, do we manage to have foresight, given that we ourselves are products of Darwinian natural selection, which only favours short-term goals? And some people have even complained of what they see as an inconsistency, almost an illogicality, in the position that I'm adopting. How can I, on the one hand, say that we are the products of Darwinian selection, which is incorrigibly short-sighted and selfish, yet at the same time say that salvation lies in humanity's capacity for looking far ahead. And the answer lies in the fact that brains, although they are themselves the natural products of natural selection, follow their own rules which can rise above the rules of natural selection. This is, is obvious in the case of the example of contraception. Contraception is clearly anti-Darwinian. It would be hard to imagine anything more anti-Darwinian than deliberately limiting your own reproductive success, yet we do it. The brain is big enough to override the imperatives of the selfish genes. The brain exists originally as a device to aid gene survival, the ultimate rationale for the brain's existence and for its large size in our own species is like everything else in the living world gene survival which in, tends to imply short term selfishness but as part of this the brain has been equipped the human brain at least has been equipped by the natural selection of genes with the power to take its own decisions which can override the ultimate goals which were originally used to program it. We can take decisions which are not based upon the ultimate Darwinian value of gene survival but upon other proximal values such as hedonistic pleasure or such as something more noble, something such as sitting down together with peoples of the world and trying to plan what would be the best future for the whole of the planet. Totally unique, totally foreign to our evolutionary past. Darwinian selection of genes originally built into our brains, primitive values such as hedonistic pleasure, orgasm or enjoyment of a sweet taste, but it is an evident fact that the brain, especially the human brain, is able to override its ultimate programming, to dispense with the ultimate value of gene survival and substitute other values, including, of course, things like love of art and music, which Patrick Holden's friend was so wrongly ashamed of. And among these values is, of course, the long-term survival of the planet and other things for which Greenpeace so, so single-mindedly struggles. So my conclusion is that the natural, at least the natural of natural selection, has few virtues that we would wish to import into our human political life, at least. It has been a part of our life for most of our ancestry, but we would be well advised to, in a sense, mistrust it, even fight against it. I've said that although I am a passionate Darwinian, in the academic sense, that I believe that Darwinism is the main ingredient in our understanding of our own existence and that of all life, I am a passionate da Darwinian in that sense, yet I am a passionate anti-Darwinian when it comes to human, social, and political affairs and political planning for the world. Nature really is red in tooth and claw. Nature really is ruthless, selfish, greedy. Nature, in its Darwinian role of natural selection, is not something we should wish to emulate.